So good afternoon, everybody. My name is Adara Goldberg, and I'm the director of the Holocaust Resource Center at Queen University in Union, New Jersey. Um, we're really glad to see all of you on this beautiful afternoon if you're in our area. And I hope that if you're joining from elsewhere, you were experiencing the same sun and cherry blossoms that I am outside. And it's a nice treat. So we are really pleased to present tonight's program in collaboration with the Holocaust and Genocide Center at St. Elizabeth University. And now to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Bernice Lerner. Dr. Lerner is the author of All the Horrors of War, A Jewish Girl, A British Doctor, and The Liberation of Bergen-Belsen, and other writings about the Holocaust and on virtue ethics. As director of Boston University Center for Character and Social Responsibility, Bernice lectured widely, conducted professional development for educators, and taught courses on character education as well as the Holocaust. As the Dean of Adult Learning at Hebrew College, she created a host of innovative programs, including the acclaimed Maya, a two-year journey through Jewish history. Um, Dr. Lerner earned a bachelor's from Stony Brook University, a master's degree from the Jewish Theological Seminary, and a doctorate from Boston University. And with that, I am going to turn things to Dr. Lerner. So thank you, everyone. Okay, thank you so much, Adara, and thank you to the Holocaust Resource Center at Keene University and St. Elizabeth's for co-sponsoring this event. And to all of you who are sitting, listening to a webinar during uh, when it's so beautiful outside. So thank you for coming. Um, I'm going to give um, a presentation today called The Ethics of Rescue. And I'm going to be talking about the liberation of the what was at the end of the war, the largest Nazi concentration camp. Um, my mother was there. And so I wrote a, I wrote a book about her and um, it's a dual biography. It's about my mom and it's about the man who was responsible for rescue and relief efforts at Bergen-Belsen. So I'm now going to share my screen with you and begin my presentation. Okay. So um, my book is a dual biography, which is quite a challenge to write. Um, so, um, and I'll tell you a little bit how I went about it, but here um, I gave these same images to my publisher in the United States here, the book is called All the Horrors of War, and to the publisher in the UK, uh, which had the same images and text, but came up with a completely different concept for the cover. So let me just explain to you a bit about the two characters I write about and the stage of life at which they were caught when they were experiencing these very extreme events from different perspectives, right? One as a rescuer and one as a victim. So here's my mom, and this is about seven months after the war. And you can see that the bruises on her face, she had been very severely beaten up, have healed. And you can see that she's well nourished. And this is a picture taken again, seven months after the war, she had just turned 16 years old. And she is, though she looks okay, she looks serious, right? She doesn't look like a joyful survivor, but uh, she's orphaned. She is really very, very sick. Here she is. You could see the actual background of where she is in this top picture here. It's in a tuberculosis sanitarium in snowy Northwest Sweden, a place called Arvika. But I wanted to show her full standing here. Here's a picture of Glenn Hughes. Um, he is 52 years old in this picture. He had just liberated Bergen-Belsen and he is startled by the cameraman, right? And here you can see a better view of where he is, which is the caravan, a caravan in which he set up his office and did his work at Bergen-Belsen. At this point, he is deputy director of medical services for the entire British Second Army. So he's a very, very high up in the hierarchy. And he is trying to mastermind the liberation of this place. And um, it is a great challenge because he was not expecting to arrive in this concentration camp. Bergen-Belsen, you should know, was liberated by the British 
three weeks before the end of World War II. The world war was still raging. There were battles throughout Northwest Germany and he was very instrumental in orchestrating the medical relief of wounded soldiers and burying the dead, uh, but really battlefield focused. So um, this concentration camp was a surprise. It was only concentration camp formally turned over to the allied forces. So I had to, I figured out, I had to figure out, it took a very long time, years actually, to figure out how to tell the story of these two very different people who just happened to converge at the same place at the same time. But one, my mother, whose life and my life, you know, in consequence is owed to the efforts of the British Second Army and to this man who was in charge because um, really my mother was near death at the end of the war and had the British come into Bergen-Belsen just a few days later, I would not be here giving this presentation. I would not have, so she would not have survived. So that's how close and how critical it was. So I decided to tell the story as really a race against time rescue story that takes place in the last year of the war. And that is my focus. But you have to realize that this race against time was lost for way too many people. So I was very interested in the minute by minute, blow by blow, what did it take for the allies to arrive at this camp? And how did my mother get to this camp? So the meat of my book is four seasons, beginning with the spring of 1944 and going to the summer, fall, winter. And the fifth season is the, fit, um, the spring of 1945, when my two protagonists converge in Bergen-Belsen. The meat of the book is sandwiched in between the Belsen trial, some tr um, paragraphs about the Belsen trial, which is really uh, was significant. It happened right before the Nuremberg trials and Glenn Hughes was the first witness. And this is actually an image from Army Talks magazine from November, 1945, when um, the court is in session and there's 45 Nazi functionaries, some very outstanding characters for how despicable they were, but this is Irma Gracie number nine, who was called the beautiful blonde beast, um, who was a very sadistic guard in both Auschwitz and Bergen-Belsen, who wound up being beheaded for her crimes. But there's 45 Nazi functionaries on the docket here. Um, you have to realize that there was more than 800 Nazi functionaries working in Bergen-Belsen and most of them got off scot-free. But uh, I talk about the trial here a little bit, um, different aspects of it here and here. And then I sandwich the book further um, between a prologue and an epilogue, both of which allow me to tell really important stories about my mom um, leading up to the up to the Holocaust, up to the war and the Brigadier, as well as the epilogue, which talks about both of them as well. What came after? How did this experience of the extreme affect both of them for the rest of their lives? So now what I'm going to do is share with you a few markers along the timeline. I'm not going to go into all the details because I do wanna focus in this talk on the ethics of rescue. But I'm just going to tell you just a little bit to give you a little bit of context. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the starting point, that spring of 1944, where Glenn Hughes was in the Yorkshire Wolds in northern England, and where my mom was in Siget. And then I'm going to tell you a little bit about D-Day and a little bit about Auschwitz and then how it was that my mother came to Bergen-Belsen. I'm not going to go through uh, everything that Glenn Hughes witnessed and observed and tried to orchestrate and all the battles on the way. Suffice it to say that his, he was originally up here in the Yorkshire Worlds, head of the British uh, Second Army's Eighth Corps, which saw some of the most vicious fighting by Nazi, with Nazi panzer units in Normandy and all the way up through here. And he had to, he was a medical organizer who had to figure out how to evacuate casualties, how to um, provide medical care for them, how to set up regimental aid posts and casualty clearing stations, how to com commandeer hospitals. And here's where he started in the Yorkshire Wolds. And 
the place was chosen because the topography supposedly resembled that which they would encounter when they landed in Normandy. Of course, the Normandy hedgerows really um, were quite an obstacle for the Allied forces fighting in Normandy, uh, trying to get, you know, eventually breach the fortress of Germany. But what I want to just say here, and this is something just to file uh, for later in this presentation, is that Glenn Hughes was a stalwart for preparedness. He prided himself on the fact that his Eighth Corps was the most practiced corps. The nurses, the doctors, they knew how to operate very efficiently, how to assemble um, tents, uh, what's needed for regimental aid posts, how to take them down in record time, because it's a moving battle thing, right? And also every surgery was planned down to the last second. You know, maxillofacial surgeries would take X amount of hours plus this amount of minutes. Everything was planned and practiced. And of course there would have to be improvisation along the way, but he wanted people to be as prepared as possible and to imagine what it was like caring for soldiers. It was a, the British second army had an excellent medical corps during the war. My mom came from Siget. So um, it, this is a small town here, here in Northern Transylvania. When she was born, it was Romania. When she was 10 years old, the Hungarians came in and took this region of Northern Transylvania. So for a kid, it might've been pretty crazy making, right? You're in school one day and you have Romanian teachers and everything's taught in Romanian. And then like the next day, they're dismissed. The Romanian teachers are dismissed and the Hungarian teachers are brought in. And if you say a word of Romanian, you are fined money. So it was kind of, must have been crazy making for the children. But um, for a lot of the people living there, especially um, the Jews in this town of Siget, the older generation had been brought up under Hungarian rule. So they were very familiar with Hung Hungarian. They fought for Austro-Hungarian Austro Empire in the First World War. And they actually greeted the Hungarians with flowers and they were happy when the Hungarians came in. Little did they know how bad things would turn as Hungary was allied with Nazi Germany. So very sadly, we don't have a single photograph of my mom's or her family from before the war. So she was 14 years old. She was really one of the youngest people to survive Auschwitz and then Bergen-Belsen. And she was just a kid. She was just a kid. And she was with her older sister who was just 16. And they couldn't always advocate for themselves. And they couldn't they couldn't figure out how to get place, you know, they couldn't make that many decisions even after the war for themselves. So they never went back, they never got any photographs, they never, it was kind of a hole in our in our family. But at one point, I did try to plumb my mom's memory, and I had her draw a map of Siget. I mean, I, I, from the time I was little, I always asked her a lot about her childhood. And she told me these very adventurous stories. I mean, she lived a very different life than I did growing up on Long Island. It was, she came from a very poor family, which had its own kind of romance about it. Like she played with toys made out of walnut shells. I mean, is she it was very intriguing to me um, how she grew up. Anyway, so she lived in this small apartment on this alleyway between the street called Timar Utsa, Jew Street, and Kigyo Utsa, Snake Street. And here's her, where her apartment was. And Timar Utsa actually means leather tanning street because there were leather tanning vats somewhere on the street. And Ellie Wiesel lived right over here. I don't know if you know him, but um, you should. He's, a, he's a, one of the most famous writers about the Holocaust and uh, advocate of human rights. Anyway, he lived right here, uh, like a few minutes walk from her house. And I went to see Siget just before the pandemic broke. And I couldn't, uh, the town was 12,000 people and 40% of them were Jewish. So it would had a very Jewish flavor when Ellie Wiesel was growing up, when my mother was growing up, you could feel the Sabbath, you knew when all the, the rhythm of the Jewish holidays and the Jews and the non-Jews got along very well and they, they understood each other and each other's practices. But of course the Jewish community had been completely wiped out 
But when I went there, right, the streets hadn't moved, the mountains hadn't moved. So I could kind of try to walk the distances from where my mom's apartment was to the place where they were taken the, to the train station, how far it was that they had to march when they were evacuated so cruelly and traumatically from their home. Um, yeah, so the Hungarian Jews, this is all part of the Hungarian provinces. This is a certain chapter of the Holocaust that maybe you have a background on, maybe you don't quite understand. But at this point in the war, when the Germans came into Hungary, it was by this point, 90% of the three plus million Polish Jews had already been murdered. This was very late in the war. This is when the world knew the world leaders knew what was going on. The people in, in Siget did not know because they weren't allowed to have radios. There was no newspapers. They had. They just kept hoping that the war would come to an end and it wouldn't reach them. But the Hungar Jews from these Hungarian provinces were the last mass of unmolested Jews to be murdered. And it happened rapid fire fast. So my mother would say to me, when she, you know, if someone were to tell you that within two months time, your entire family would be wiped out, you, everything you owned would be taken from you, your community would be gone, everything you knew and loved would be destroyed, would you believe them? You would think they were crazy. And that's how it felt to her. She at 14 years old had never slept, go, visit, gone anywhere outside of her town of Siget. She hadn't even gone to the surrounding villages. So. She hadn't slept out anywhere apart from her home. So you can kind of imagine the trauma of the deportation and then arriving in a place like Auschwitz. So I'm gonna jump ahead to another just marker on the timeline, just to point some something out to you that's I think really uh, drives home the point of this mass murder of 440,000 Jews in a very fast way over just a couple of months in the spring and summer of 1944. On June 6, you saw this magnificent armada of the allies, the Canadians, Americans, and the British landing on the coast of Normandy and this unbelievable military invasion that really the Germans were not expecting them to, uh, to arrive on these beaches. And you saw terrible fighting. The Germans did mobilize fast and bring their vicious panzer units there very quickly. And um, so and we know about the Americans and the terrible number of casualties on Omaha Beach. 7,000 boats brought 150,000 troops to this area to fight Allied troops. On this day, June 6, 1944, about 4,414 Allied soldiers were killed in battle. And there were more who were wounded, but 4, 000, over 4,400 were killed. But on this very same day in Auschwitz, more than twice the number of Jews were murdered. Um, more than 9,000 were murder murdered. And moreover, after, during the fighting in Normandy every day, as vicious and terrible as it was, as ferocious were the battles, fewer allied soldiers died every day after the landing. Whereas in Auschwitz-Birkenau, in Birkenau, the numbers remained very high through the end of July. About 10,000 people were killed in the gas chambers every day. The gas chambers were, had been equipped, the ovens were equipped with new par parts, um, a railroad spur brought people very close into the vicinity of the gas chambers. And it was just the greatest factory of killing, of murdering innocent human beings ever in history. Um, you can see here, these, these photos are very valuable. Um, they were taken by an SS officer, probably most likely to document the efficiency of the killing process but they had an unintended effect, which is that they provide testimony. They were found by a survivor, Lily Jacobs, at the very end of the war. Um, and she was in the, sleeping in an SS officer's place and it was his album and she turned them over eventually to Yad Vashem. So we have these 192 photographs that were in the album that tell quite a story. And here it looks like, I mean, people don't know where the Hungarian transports, this was, 
from a transport probably a few days after my mother arrived from um, a Czech transport from Berekses. And people didn't know where they were. Like they didn't know where they had landed. And it was very shocking after several days in the, one of these cattle wagons where they were cooped up and some people died from the asphyxiation, thirst, starvation. You know, it was just terrible conditions if you were old and weak. And it was very, very tough for, to stay in these cattle wagons for three to four days. And then they arrive in this place and they don't know where they are. So this picture on the bottom looks kind of like orderly and organized. Here's the SS officers, there's women, there's men, they're about to go through the selection. There's another line that you can't see in this picture that are coming from this direction. And, but there's a lot of chaos. If you look closely, people don't know where they are. Here's a woman, looks like she's turning to talk to a child. Here's one man who turns to talk to the other. Like they're talking amongst themselves. Where are we? They had never heard of this place. Total confusion and terror. So now that was June of now That photo was from probably late May, but um, we just talked about the uh, uh, landing in Normandy, June 6, 1944. Fast forward, I'm not going to tell you all the, the details of what happened in my, to, in my mom's life in between, but fast forward to the liberation of Auschwitz, Birkenau, where my mother was not at this point. She was long gone from Auschwitz, Birkenau. Um, but the famous liberation of Auschwitz-Birkenau by the Russians was on January 27th, 1945, which the United Nations chose as the day to mark International Holocaust Remembrance Day, because Auschwitz was notorious, right? It was the largest manu killing, killing factory. But strangely, maybe not strangely, if you, if you have a sense of what was happening, the events that were happening historically, the Germans were losing the war. The Russians were coming in from the east and they were liberating camps in the way. And they came, they were in the vicinity of Auschwitz in January. So mid-January, there was about 55 to 60,000 remaining inmates in January. And they were evacuated from Auschwitz, Birkenau. They were taken away. So when the Russians actually came into the camp complex, they found fewer than 8,000 survivors there. So um, here is, uh, just to show you, here's Auschwitz I, the main Auschwitz camp. And Birkenau was up here, it was about two miles away, which was where their gas chambers were, which is where uh, the like 90% of the people coming in from Hungary, from the Hungarian provinces were murdered. And about four miles away was Buna. Buna means synthetic rubber, which was a slave labor camp. And there was only 1,200 people in Auschwitz I, 5,800 in Auschwitz II, and 600 in Auschwitz III. So fewer than 8,000 inmates were remaining. In January of 1945, there were about 750,000 Jews who had managed to survive thus far in the war. And they were put on these death marches, like the evacuees from Auschwitz. No matter what kind of slave labor camp they were in or wherever, the idea was that they were going to be marched away from the liberators because no one, upon Hitler's orders, no Jewish person was to fall alive into the hands of allies, allies, the allies. So from Auschwitz, they were marched about 30 miles either northwest or, or mostly west. And then they were put on cattle cars again and then taken to um, certain camps deep in Germany, deposit them in places away from the liberating forces. So here you see Bergen, Belsen. Bergen-Belsen here in the north, deep in northwest Germany, received the largest number of these war-ravaged souls. So, um, and remember that this about 750,000 people were surviving in, very, in thousands of labor camps along the way, and at least probably a third of them, at least 250,000 died on the death marches. The death marches in the bitter cold winter of 1945, and they didn't have adequate clothing, adequate, adequate footwear, barely any food, sleeping in barns or in pigsties, and a lot of them were killed along the way. The orders were that if anyone had to stop or step out of line, they were to be shot. And I talk about this in my book and my mother's 
reaction. And my mother was, remember she was 15 years old. She had turned 15 that fall. And her reactions are very much through the lens of a teenager. Although teenagers had to grow up, young people had to grow up very quickly. They were still kids. So, um, so she, it was some of her reactions were very much from that teenage perspective. And I just want to say that um, developmentally, you know, four, 13, 14, 15 years old have most of them, I mean, everyone's in their own story, but most of them are able to take care of themselves in a lot of ways, but they still need adult guidance. You know, she still needed her mom, who she didn't have with her, her father. So um, she was very much on her own. And she was endowed with certain biological traits and things because of her, her childhood, her hard scrabble childhood that maybe, maybe enabled her to fend for herself. Anyway, so people are being marched and marched and eventually put into cattle wagons and then taken to these places in deep in Germany and in very bad shape. So Bergen Belsen received people who had managed to evade the gas chambers survived slave labor, survived death marches. And you can imagine the kind of shape they were in when they landed in this place that had no sanitary facilities, barely, hardly any food. And in the last five days before it was liberated, no food and no water and really nothing to provide for these tens of thousands of people converging in this hell and they were to totally unprepared and there were not gas chambers there. So the sites were very different than the sites in Auschwitz, which was sort of a spick and span kind of hell. People were either coming fresh from home or in the, in the clouds in the sky, the gas chambers were going day and night. Whereas bergen Belsen people were emaciated and very sick and death was ubiquitous. So I'm going to now show you some, some things that are can be very unpleasant, graphic, upsetting. So if you uh, have a difficult time with these kinds of things, you may wanna take a pause or take a deep breath or go away and come back <laughs> because it's, these are, these, I have to say that bergen Bilsen was the most photographed uh, of all the concentration camps at the end. Um, the British Second Army, the film and photographic unit came in right when the liberators came in and they had a very strong purpose to document what was what they saw. The photographers became sick, nauseous, splitting headaches because they weren't used to taking these kind of photographs, but they knew it was important and the and and the other reason was that what they saw, they thought nobody would believe. They couldn't describe it. They couldn't tell it. They knew that no photograph or film could ever really show what it was like. But nevertheless, they felt this moral imperative to document what they saw. So in a really strange story, Himmler decides to hand bergen Belsen over to the British against Hitler's orders. And this is, remember, this is toward the very end of the war. April 12th, a, a truce is signed between the British and the Germans. And on that day, um, the Germans decide that they want to have a cleanup in the camp because there are corpses lying everywhere. And I'm just gonna, I'll tell you one thing that um, my mom, when she started to tell me about her wartime experiences. And when she got to bergen Belsen, we used to be down in the laundry room where I used to watch her and we would talk while she ironed. And I remember, I remember so clearly that one, as she was describing what she was doing in bergen Belsen, she put down the iron, she stepped away from the ironing board, she bent forward and she stretched her arms out behind her, demonstrating for me how she, who was, she said she was 50% dead, had to drag people during this days of cleanup down this road to mass grave at the end. And this lasted, this kind of cleanup lasted for about two days. The, at the end, there was a mass grave where the bodies were to be dumped. 
It lasted about two days because people kept dying on the job. The Germans had to stop. So my mother said that she was 50% dead. Anyone who had a little strength in them was forced to do this work. And she said some of the people were that she had to drag were 90% dead. They were still breathing. And she turned to her sister and she said, um, yeah, that she, some of the people died with like their mouth and their eyes open. And she, she pointed this out to her sister. Her sister said, that means that they really wanted to live. And she said, well, we all wanted to live, but I don't think we will. At that point, they didn't think they will. So here is or here are some images that tell a story. And I just want to prepare you that some of the war artists who tried to document this to bear witness, some of their depictions are more graphic than even the photographs. I, I tried not to not to show you some of the images that the um, filmer, the photographers took. But just to give you a sense, um, this is a painting by a British soldier. It's in the Australia War Museum. But this is what happened. There was about 80 SS officers who remained in the camp um, for the turnover to the British. And the British, here's the British soldiers with their guns trained on them. And their job was now to help clean up the camp and, and the corpses lying everywhere. And I tremble showing you these pictures. I mean, they could be, you know, one of them could have been my mother's cousin whom she saw in Bergen Bills. And they, these were people who had lives and they had families and this was what they had been reduced to. And here in the background, you can see some of the survivors who were well enough, who were sort of leering at the SS officers and watching them do this work. So I'm gonna talk just for a minute about the ethics of rescue. So some things to keep in mind about this, this period in time was um, the moral motivation. Uh, Glenn Hughes, uh, who had seen all the horrors of war, that's where the title of my book comes from. He said, I have seen all the horrors of war, but nothing to touch it, nothing to touch Bergen Belsen. Maybe my book should have been called Nothing to Touch It. But um, he, 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 as I mentioned in the beginning, he was a stalwart for preparedness. And here he came in and he did not know how he was going to go about trying to save lives. This was, there were 55 to 60,000 people in the camp. He uh, estimated, he surveyed the camp right away and he gave a very accurate assessment. He said, 25,000 need immediate medical attention, hospitalization, and of these, I will be unable to save 14,000 people. He knew it would be a real challenge. You needed an enormous amount of uh, number of medical personnel, which he didn't have. And how were they going to orchestrate the rescue? How were they going to try to save as many lives as, as possible? So first of all, he wanted to save lives. And, and he knew he, he, it's not, it can't be done by giving individualized medical attention. It has to be done in some kind of factory style manner. Um, he had to be ready to break rules. He was supposed to report and ask for permission from his higher ups and he, there was no time for that. There had to be a lot of resourcefulness and innovation. Where are you going to get 14,000 blankets from? Where are you going to get all the pails you need? Where are you going to get the soap? Where are you going to get DDT to disinfect people? How are you going to go about this? It needed decisive action because you had to move very quickly and it was really hard. I mean, as you know, all rescue efforts take time, right? There was the rescue efforts in Hurricane Katrina or um, what happened with the earthquake in Turkey. And it just doesn't happen. Like when you snap your fingers, it, it takes time to mobilize and get people, but you have to act quickly. Compassion. Um, the people that were being handled did not look human, right? They A lot of them were uh, full of sores and skeletal and emaciated, and they didn't look like human beings. Uh, so the soldiers and the people who were treating them had to look inside themselves for their wells, wells of compassion to realize that these were 
to treat the stranger, the other, with compassion, with kindness, and not as a stranger, but as a fellow human being with, that des deserves respect and to respect their dignity. And then to be receptive to unfolding phenomena. As the people, as people started to get some kind of medical care or to be put in settings where they could rally if they were able to rally, um, they started to um, ask about the war and current events and what was happening. But they also still behaved in some ways, like you might say crazy people. There's a lot of stories about that. Um, you know, um, if they were in the hospital room, some people, orderlies or nurses found like chickens under pillows. If people wandered into the countryside, they, you know, they stole things. They they hoarded food wherever they could. Um, there's one story about a, a woman who's using like a broken comb and a mirror. And one soldier says to another, look at her, she's crazy. And, and uh, the Jewish chaplain says, well, if you give her a whole comb and a real mirror, see which one she uses, because these people were really suffering, had suffered such grave depredations. So I'm going to show you now some more images from the horror camp. Just again, the, the pictures can't really show it, but the pictures themselves are so jarring and upsetting. So you can see the squalor. And this picture reminded me of um, a story my mom told me about scavenging for potatoes in the days after the official liberation on April 15th and trying to cook them and you could see these women are inured to the scenes and to the smell in the background. And so my mom has a story about running to these mounds of potatoes. Um, you have to realize that um, the British Second Army when they came up in right away, they were shocked. <clears throat> they were not expecting to have to deal with this extent of uh, the situation. And um, they had to leave Hungarian soldiers in charge. So after the liberation, these Hungarian soldiers sitting in watchtowers would shoot at inmates who would run to the potato mounds. So there was a lot of killing going on after the liberation. And here you see a couple of other images um, of food being doled out. Now I should say that they initially didn't know how to feed people. More than 2,000 people died in Bergen-Belsen on account of their first meal because people in a state of emaciation, their intestines are shriveled and they have to be fed very careful diets. And here's an image that I think also tells a story. You can see this girl has a square cut out of the back of her coat. She probably came from a slave labor camp probably coats that were taken away from people who were shipped to Auschwitz were taken then to some of the slave labor camps. And here she has one, but a big square had to be cut out of the back. So lest she try to escape, she should be easily identifiable as a halfling, as a prisoner. And the 11th Lightfield Ambulance did pitch this dump of tentage. I'm gonna show you, you're gonna see a series of paintings by the British war artist, Leslie Cole. And again, they're very graphic. They show something of the, I don't know, the pathos, the emotion, something even that the photographs don't, don't quite capture. And here is of a mass grave. Um, there was no choice what to do with these dead people. Um, they had to be buried quickly because of the threat of cholera with the summer coming. So these, there were about 15 mass graves that were dug by the British. They were about eight feet wide, about 12 feet long and about 20 feet deep. And here's Rabbi Leslie Hardman, who is bereft at how these people are being buried helter skelter in the grave. And he is going mad going really mad. And here he is with um, uh, another rabbi, Isaac Levy, who came in a couple of days later to try to help him because there were so many survivors to minister to. And they understood Yiddish. They could speak the language of most of the survivors. And it was just a very, very terrible situation. 
So where they were buried, there were grave markers. And I have to tell you that um, there was a lot of guesswork here, right? Um, so here, this grave marker at the time said 5,000 are buried here. And here is a beautiful tombstone now. If you go to Bergen-Belsen that you'll see, some were marked 5,000 were buried here, some 2,000, some 10,000. And you'll also see if you go to Bergen-Belsen, a beautiful tombstone for Anne and Margot Frank. But I can promise you that this is not the location in which they are buried. So the, um, on the third day after the liberation, April 18th, finally some help came and the British 11th Light Field Ambulance came and print pitched a dump of tentage. And this becomes very significant in my story. It's a really important story because those who were ambulatory were told to get out of these very overcrowded, dense huts where there was dead and living occupying the same space, very overcrowded in order to get some, a sip of water maybe to someone in the huts, they needed to relieve the overcrowding. So if you could walk a little bit, you were told to go to a tent. And my mom was with four others in a tent and just the liberation is more complicated than you would know, right? You think that the liberators come in and people are freed and yay, we're free and we're gonna celebrate and it's joyous. and it was way more complicated than that. Maybe some inmates who were in better shape, maybe they were very recent arrivals of just coming a few days before the liberation could greet their liberators with gratitude and joy, but most people were very far gone. And my mom had been in Bergen-Belsen over a month at this point, and every second was like an eternity. But somehow she was well enough to leave the hut to go. She could still walk and go into a tent, but she was very sick. And on the day that it was her turn to close the flap door of the tent, she was expelled by the other girls in the tent and had to crawl back to the hut where she was severely beaten up. So there was a lot of things that were taking place on the ground in the day after the liberation and no one in charge could do anything about this chaos. So one of the things I mentioned that a lot of Nazis left the camp or disappeared right before it was handed over to the British. 80 remained for the transfer, but hundreds and hundreds disappeared and got off scot-free and they sabotaged the water supply before they left. So the British Royal Engineers had to figure out a way to pump water into the camp, how to set up makeshift showers for people. Uh, Glenn Hughes ordered the mayors in the nearby town and some of the citizens to come to see what their countrymen had wrought, their compatriots. And then how were they going to go about saving lives? So this is part of the rescue. So here are men from the 11th Light Field Ambulance and they were going to go hut by hut and mark people who had a chance, who they were breathing, who were not too far gone, who they thought had a chance of survival, mark them with a red X with chalk on their forehead and take them in these, what they called contaminated ambulances to a cavalry stables about two miles away from the camp. And there at that cavalry stables, they set up 60 tables and they corralled nurses from the area at, to put them into work cleaning and spraying the inmates with DDT. And this is a drawing by someone who came to Bergen-Belsen to evaluate and record the work of the Red Cross. There's a woman heading out with the, with the pail. And, my mom has a, also a sort of, she has a lot of tragic anecdotes she told me about everything, including being in the human laundry. So I'm just gonna read you some stats from the bottom here. Um, one, one of the things I should just mention is that the survivors who emerged as kind of leaders and helpers to Glenn Hughes uh, sensed his compassion and his warmth and named the hospital there on the premises that they set up, the Glenn Hughes Hospital. So there were 14,000 patients in the Glen Hughes Hospital, the largest such facility in Europe, 14,000 beds, can you imagine, on May 19th, 1945. 
It took two weeks for the backlog of corpses to be buried. 500 former inmates died each day for a month after the liberation. There was only 361 British Army soldiers and medical personnel there on April 17th, two days after. 750 to 1,000 sick were processed each day for over three weeks after the liberation at the Human Laundry. And there was about 25,000 survivors who were deemed fit. That meant that they were able to walk up three steps to a truck. And they put them in these transit and rehabilitation barracks in what they called Camp 2. Camp 1 was the horror camp. And Camp 2 was where the people who were well enough, it was a formerly Wehrmacht barracks, but it was very fungible, right? Sometimes the fit got sick and had to go into the hospital. And sometimes, not too often, but sometimes people recovered enough to be able to go to this camp too. So here's Glenn Hughes. He would not allow the British flag, the Union Jack, to be hoisted on May 8th, Victory in Europe Day. It was not over in Bergen-Belsen until the last hut was burned down. All the huts had to be burned down after they uh, were evacuated because of the typhus germ. There was a lot of sickness and germs in the camp. So on May 21st, there was a big ceremony. There are British soldiers here and displaced persons who came to see the burning of the last hut. And then he could declare the war over. So now I'm just gonna read you something that just gives you a little bit of sense of the sensitivity that was required on the part of the liberations. Um, it was around the time that the Red Cross arrived, although it may have no connection, that a very large quantity of lipstick arrived. And this is being told by this Lieutenant uh, Gonin, commander of the 11th Light Field um, Ambulance of the Royal Army Medical Corps. This is not at all what we men wanted. We were screaming for hundreds of thousands of other things and I don't know who asked for lipstick. I wish so much that I could discover who did it. It was the action of genius, sheer unadulterated brilliance. I believe nothing did more for these internees than the lipstick. Women lay in bed with no sheets and no naive, but with scarlet red lips. You saw them wandering around about with nothing but a blanket over their shoulders but with scarlet red lips. And I leave it to you to think about what the lipstick did for these inmates. And this sign was erected um, in Bergen-Belsen. Um, actually, I just discovered this website by this, um, this grandson of this Reginald Price from the 113th Durham Light Infantry. He was the sign maker and he was this helper. helper. And um, so this was the sign he made. He made all the signs you saw in Bergen-Belsen. And here it says um, 10,000 unburied dead were found here. Another 13,000 have since died, all of them victims of the German new order in Europe and an example of Nazi Kultur. So I'm just going to very quickly um, just show you some images. Fast forward from the epilogue, uh, the epilogue um, different pictures than you would find in my book. Um, everything I've showed you today, I show different images in my book. This is Glenn Hughes at the time of the liberation. You can see the seriousness in his eyes. He's 52 years old, unprepared, devastated, trying to um, move into action very quickly. Here he is some years later. He is a golfer. He's a sportsman. He is one of the founding fathers of rugby football in England. And his post-war story is quite interesting. And it may intersect with your own life in a way you would not anticipate. If you've ever had a family member in hospice, um, he was very, very influential in the founding of the hospice movement. And I, I connect it maybe to having witnessed and not and being powerless to do so uh, anything. We're really about so many tortured deaths. Here's my mom. She's a young woman in Sweden. She's um, orphaned. Um, she is slowly coming into her own and maturing 10 years in and out of TB sanatoriums in Sweden. Here she is with her sister, the only surviving member of her very large family. Um, here's her wedding to my dad. Here's my dad in a displaced persons camp. Here uh, I am with uh, my mom and 
three of my aunts who are also survivors of Bergen-Belsen. These two are my father's sisters. They each have their own miraculous story of survival. And here's my mom. Um, sadly, she died this past October, but before then, um, she spent the past decade lecturing and telling her story to school groups. And you can imagine that she was really able to relate to them and them to her because she had this experience through the lens of an adolescent, a teenager. So this is my presentation. Here um, is the sign I showed you before, and here it was translated into German in Bergen-Belsen. And I know that it's pretty hard to... Um, digest all this material and even to come up with any questions, but I'm always happy to answer them now or at a later date. You can always reach me through my website, which is bernicelearner.com. So I'm now going to stop the share and I'm here to talk about whatever you want. Hi, um, my name is Sharon Gottlieb, Crystal Gottlieb. And my uh, mother was liberated, also liberated in Bergen-Belsen. And um, my father was brought there, came there uh, after uh, the DP camp was set up. They met, married, and lived there. I'm actually uh, a Bergen-Belsen baby. I was born in Bergen-Belsen, March 25th, 1948. Are there any other Bergen-Belsen babies in the group today? No. Yes. That, so, um, yeah, and then um, my relatives in Canada uh, were searching for survivors, the cousins of uh, my father and grandfather. My father actually survived with his own father. They were in slave labor, and they were probably in about 12 different, they were uh, slave labor camps. They were originally from Annapol, Rachev, Poland, uh, uh, near Warsaw. And they were taken all over Europe. I mean, they were in Poland, they were in Germany, they were in France, they were in um, um, close to Italy, they, they were in Holland, they were taken everywhere and um, eventually ended up um, near Hanover, um, and then they uh, then they went to Bremen, and then they came to uh, Bergen-Belsen, where my mother was liberated. She had typhus. She had typhus. She was in one of those hospitals, and um, and dysentery, of course. And um, yeah, I mean, I'm just very proud of them. I want to ask you, how? Um, where were you born? So first, Sharon, thank you so much for sharing that. You were probably born in the Glen Hughes Hospital. I um, was. I was born in the Glen Hughes Hospital. I forget, that was the first thing I wanted to tell you. And when I was visiting Yad Vashem about 10 years ago, and I had the opportunity to do research on my, my grandparents and, my, and all so many of people that were lost, um, I was done and she ran after me. She says, I have a document here for a Sarah Crystal. And I said, well, that's me. She says, well, and I looked at it. It was my birth certificate from the Glenn Hughes Hospital, which I had never seen. I had never seen. Well, yeah. he was enormously proud that 2000 babies were born in the years after the war in the Glenn Hughes Hospital. And that's a big, you're a part of that history. And yes, I am. Group. And, um, the, you know, Bergen-Belsen saw one of the largest record number of weddings and baby booms in human history. So you're very special to have been born in that place in time. I was not born until um, 1956, 11 years after the war, because oh. my mother was a kid, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, she didn't get married until she was 25 and she met my father in Sweden and I was born in the United States. Okay, yes, great. Thank you for allowing me to share. Thank you. It says that Anita was also uh, born in the Glenn Hughes Hospital. 
It's, but she can't get her photo online to share. I can't seem to share the photo, but yes, I've been following your story. And I was supposed to be on that trip several years ago, which got canceled because of COVID. Right. Yeah. The Bergen Bells and Babies. And I live in Montreal, Quebec, <sighs> Canada. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. I, yeah. Yeah, I talk a little bit at the end of my book about what it was like for Glenn Hughes to see the survivors of Bergen Belsen uh, rebuild their lives and have families and um, how proud he was um, of you all, of the Belsen babies and, and seeing, seeing these survivors knowing, really intimately knowing what they had suffered and endured. So, Anita and Sharon, I hope that your parents' stories are recorded somewhere. They, yeah, my both my parents uh, did their testimony uh, for the Shoah Foundation, and as a matter of fact, I was paired. I volunteered to be paired with a, a, a college student um, who wanted to to learn more about uh, the Shoah. And um, so we had Zoom meetings over the whole winter and um, he, he did a phenomenal. And then yesterday, all the projects were um, presented, were displayed for the students at the, uh, uh, at the University of St. Louis in Missouri um, and was very well attended. And his, his, his thesis um, and his uh, was it, it, what's called uh, mapping the Holocaust, the, the the crystal, the story of the crystal family. So, because he was just blown away by the fact that my father and grandfather were taken to at least twelve different. When I saw the map, I saw the places that they were taken, forced and marched in cattle cars and trucks. And and my mother, um, she was in at least six Stutthof and all these other camps. So. He, 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 there are 24 captions, and uh, I, I can send it to you. It's phenomenal. Um, 24 captions with pictures, and then each one with a map of where they were. Phenomenal. So it's very well documented. Thank yeah. you. I'd love to see it. Thank you. Does anyone else have any questions? Brockle Arctic Oh, I think someone has their hand raised. Yes. Okay, sorry, I had my mic off. Um, Bernice, you contacted me in 2007. You sent an email to me because you had met my cousins in, in Boston at the time, um, Nancy and Gary Brandeis. I don't know if the names mean anything to you because it's so long ago. When I asked them about you after I read your book and was absolutely hard in my stomach um, because you told the story of my mother. My mother never talked about her experiences in Bergen-Belton. You told her story. And I too was born in the Glen Hughes Hospital in 1947. My parents also were match made by a Shetran uh, my dad came from one of the Gross Rosen work camps looking for relatives and came to Bergen-Belsen and found my mother. And they married in, in 46. I was born in 47. And we came to Toronto in, in actually May uh, 6th, 1948. And here we are, Yom HaShoa. And, um, and celebrating the 76th anniversary of liberation of Bergen-Belsen. And as I speak, Karen Lasky, who was also born in Bergen-Belsen from Toronto, is there now as, as part of that commemoration. But the email you sent me, you, you said um, that you knew I had been born in Bergen-Belsen and what could I tell you? And I was off to the opening of the Bergen-Belsen Museum at that time with documents of my mother. Um, and so when I got back, I, I just sent a little bit of information to you, names of people you could contact. And, and then that was the end. Gary's youngest daughter, or middle daughter, Bella, is now third generation in New York. 
And she emailed me and she said, I'm talking about my grandfather, but I know nothing about my mother. Then I remembered and went into my file on Bergen Belsen and there you were. There was the email that you had sent me asking for information. And so your journey, your journey was the product of that amazing book. So I thank you as the Bergen Belsen child for telling the story of your mummy representative of my mummy. Oh. So, so I thank you for that. Thank you so much for saying that. Well, if I wrote to you in 2007, you can imagine how long it took me to write. Yes, exactly. Your journey. Exactly. Yeah, it was it took a little 15 years. Yeah, it took a long yeah. time. Thank you so much for sharing that. Thank you. Were there any other questions? Yes. Hi, um, my name is Desiree. Uh, I'm, I'm based in Scotland, uh, mm -hmm. originally from a tiny country uh, in East Africa, Burundi. Mm -hmm. um, Bernice, uh, I have a daughter uh, called uh, Bernice, and um, I, I, we experienced a similar uh, violence uh, um, in 1993. I was 15. And um, it's, it's just really moving up. I, I, I meet regularly with survivors from different genocides. And it's just always moving just to hear more, mm. uh, more details of, of, of uh, what the Jewish people have endured. Um, after hearing your, your story uh, on, on what the British have done, uh, it really makes me even more proud to be a British. Uh, I was welcomed as a refugee in 1999. I uh, was in my 20s. Uh, so just wanted to thank you really for sharing your story. Thank you so much for sharing a bit about yours. Sounds fascinating, important. Thank you. Any of the students present today have any questions? No. Anyone else? Actually, we were wondering, oh. Bernice, if, if you could tell us about, um, you mentioned that your mom um, was kicked out of the tent. And then we weren't sure if, if you were saying that she was beat up by other inmates, by other former. She was beat up by her compatriots. Okay. Yeah, talk about that. It's just people were like animals. Yeah. The, I talk about that in the book. It's so yeah, traumatized and just. Yeah. I talk. Yeah, I mean, there was so much going on. Yeah, you know, liberation didn't mean that bad things stopped happening. Right, right. And did she met your dad? He was also a survivor, and they met in Sweden. Yes, he was a survivor. Um, yeah, I'm just starting to. I'm researching and starting to think about writing his story. Um, and yeah, um, they met in Sweden 10 years after the war. Wow. He was living in the United States already. So he, he went there to meet her. It was kind of, kind of like, um, I don't know if you ever saw the uh, show 90 Day Fiance. Oh no, I've heard about it though. <laughs> where people meet people from other parts of the world and they right. correspond with them. And well, now that we have, there's the internet and then they go anyway. So they were, they were pen pals before they met and married in Sweden. Oh, wow. Mm. That's great. Thank you. Thanks for sharing. Thank you. Um, I have another little anecdote to share if I may. And um, there was a woman by the name of Ray Rubenstein, who was from Australia, and she left home to join and she joined the Australian Air Force because when she heard what was happening to um, the to the Jews in Europe, she wanted to fight the Nazis. She was a very headstrong young girl, and she went and she was on the entertainment division throughout the war. I, I'm not sure what she did, but after the war, she was stationed in Bergen-Belsen as a relief worker. 
And it was her job to give out the milk and the supplies that were supplied by UNRWA and the Red Cross. And it was a very dangerous job because as you pointed out, the survivors were crazy. They were unruly. They were like animals. They just wanted to get everything that, you know, of course, which is so understandable. So she looked them out among the women and she spotted my mother and she thought, you know, this, the, the, she, she, there was something about my mother that she felt she could rely on her. And she asked my mother if she would help her. So my mother became her helper and they became great friends. Um, anyway, she did that. Eventually she left uh, Bergen-Belsen. She went on the hell ships um, and took survivors to uh, what was then Palestine. And um, she then joined uh, the, um, uh, the the Israeli, well, the army. She fought in the War of Independence. She was uh, she married her commanding officer, who was Baruch Rubenstein, who was the nephew of Helena Rubenstein of the makeup. And I mean, her story is a book in itself. Anyway, she was a relief worker in Bergen-Belsen. I want to share that. Uh, those relief workers have, yeah, were witnesses to a lot of the aftermath and what happened and had really important stories to share. I'm going to read your book for sure. I'm going to read your book. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments, questions? Bernice, I, I just wanted to make a comment about um, a description of uh, Glenn Hughes when you talked about um, when he came back to England and, and every year he commemorated with the Bergen Belgian survivors and every year he talked about them as being his children because he had he had liberated them and so they were his children and I remember reading that and just being quite emotional about that. Yeah, he, yeah, he um, felt he had a connection and mm -hmm. every person who survived, it, he, he really, he was, he was like the father, he mm -hmm. was called the father of the Jewish survivors of Belsen mm -hmm. by, by leaders who emerged in Bergen-Belsen, by Josef Rosensap, who, you know, who developed mm -hmm. a very close friendship with him. He was, yeah. So I thought, I thought also in writing, actually, honestly, truth be told, I started out to write a biography of Glenn Hughes. I started the whole thing from the question of how did my mother survive? Mm -hmm. And his name pops up pretty quickly if you do a Google search on the liberation of Bergen Belsen. Mm -hmm. And he was such a compelling character. And I started to like try to figure out like, look through how do I find out who who his family was his daughter his son how do I get in touch with them I went to London a few times and I was really set on writing about this man and my mother came into the picture because many of my writing colleagues would say but your mom's story is so interesting so then I had the challenge I thought okay can I tell both of them <laughs> And uh, just also, um, truth be told, I leave myself out of the narrative. I know that a lot of people are interested in 2G, second generations, mm -hmm. but I, it was too close for me to somehow uh, write about myself and write about her in that way. So I went about, I sort of divorced myself from the fact that she's my mother. And I looked at her as who is this little mm -hmm. girl going through these things and she was, apart from the fact that she's my mother and we were super close and I loved her, she was in her own right, this really compelling character. She was like, not like Anne Frank at all. She wasn't that kind of intellectual, you know, um, a writer, but she was, um, she had a lot of responsibility as a 12 year old, as a 13 year old, and she was very moral and very interesting kid. So. I tried to get into the head of this child and what she was experiencing. So that's how I went about it. So maybe there's a part two. A part two. <laughs> um, I, I don't think, I mean, you know, 
I did write a little bit in the epilogue, like yeah, fast forward, P.S., you know, what was her life like when she was in Sweden after the war? I do have a whole presentation about this school that she went to in Sweden that sort of turned her life around and the life of other young people. How do you take young, you know, teenagers who experienced and saw such things, who were so cynical and distrustful, and how do you turn them around and help them to see the mm -hmm. good and the true and the beautiful mm -hmm. in this life? Mm -hmm. So, um, and I attribute her seven months in this school to a lot. Uh, she had this amazing opportunity to grow and learn in that way. But so I do, you know, I give a presentation, a little post-war presentation, but, um, and I talk a little bit about the epilogue, but another, uh, the other book will be about my father, I think, and mm -hmm. his, his experiences. Because my question also is like, for all these Holocaust stories and accounts is, Thank God we have so many that have been written. And I think Steven Spielberg did a marvelous thing. I mean, interviewing 52,000 survivors and survivors of other genocides included. But my thing is also what contribution can I make? What can I say that hasn't already been forth? Of course, every survivor has their own unique story. So every survivor's story is worth telling. But I, I like to give like sort of the wider context, like what did these what did these individuals navigate? Like what was happening in the bigger in the part of the war? Like why was this happening? Why, why, why? So my curiosity really led me to write this book and will lead me to write anything I write in the future. Well, best best of luck. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you for coming today and for listening. It it was wonderful to meet the voice in the book. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.